Mobile technology has become an invaluable, invaluable asset for journalists, right defenders and activists. However, the, activi the activity involves risk and repressive regimes such as those in the Middle East and North Africa also try to prevent citizens from communicating through these new tools. Let me introduce the next round table and uh, Leila Nachawati. Please. Leila is an interna the international spoker person for IRCO, which is the Spanish Association for Social Media Managers. She is a social media manager and blogger who writes up regularly about human rights and the internet, with particularly focus on Middle East, Middle East and North Africa. She contributes to Periodismo Humano, Global Voices Online, and other media like Al Jazeera. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, do we want to bring Ahmed as well and uh, have him here next to me because we're going to be having more of a dialogue than uh, individual speeches? Is that okay? Sure. Should I introduce him? Okay. So, hi, Ahmed. I'm so happy you're here because we were supposed to have uh, a couple more uh, speakers. Um, but this is what happens when you, when you count on speakers who are covering such, such difficult events as uh, the civil war, almost civil war in Yemen, or, uh, or the things that are happening in Syria or Iraq. So our, our two other speakers were trapped uh, somehow in, in, the, in the places where they are. And uh, we had an Egyptian, an, um, an outstanding uh, Al Jazeera journalist called Shirin Tadros that we're going to try to connect with in a little bit. And we had uh, an outstanding uh, Iraqi activist uh, um, who's trapped in Baghdad because uh, the army took uh, the city so he couldn't leave. This is a living proof of, uh, of uh, the real risks that we face when, uh, when we're talking about these kind of issues. It means people are, are really in a very um, difficult position and still they're managing to do great footage, great coverage of what's happening and, and share it with the world. But we have outstanding uh, Ahmed Garbiya here with us who's um, a well-known activist uh, for uh, the, the coverage he's been doing mainly behind the curtains, I'd say, sometimes. Uh, he's, he doesn't have too much of an ego and, uh, and uh, is sometimes uh, too shy about his accomplishments, but he's uh, done uh, amazing uh, coverage and footage of uh, what was happening in Egypt during the, from before, way before the mobilizations, and he's doing something that's very, very necessary, which is uh, digital archiving of all the material that's uh, being uh, gathered. So we have a lot of videos, a lot of uh, uh, contents that uh, people like Ahmed are contributing to put together. So uh, we have uh, files uh, with, the, with the revolutions and, and uh, these contests don't get lost. So, um, so here we are, I'm gonna pass this to you. Thank you, Thank you Leila. Can you hear me? How? No, it's here, right? So you can hear me anyways. Why? Why was I holding that then? <laughs> okay. <laughs> show. Okay. So mobile technology and mobilizations in the Middle East and North Africa. Feel free, please feel free to interrupt if you have any question and feel free, feel free to jump in because I know some of you guys might be shy because of the language stuff. Please, we're in Spain. Okay, don't be shy. We all have the same challenges. And uh, if the language is not perfect, it's okay. We'll, we'll understand. We're just learning and, and use this opportunity to practice your language skills as well. And please tell me when people start bashing me on Twitter. <laughs> yes. If you say crazy stuff about us, please don't, no, don't tell me. <laughs> okay. So January 14, 2011, I want to ask you before we, we go on, um, this was a hi quite historic day. And uh, anybody can tell me why this was a historic day? Come on, quick, quick, we have to be quick. Why was this a historic day? What happened on January 14, 2011? Someone who's not Ahmed. Can I give them a tip? <laughs> okay, tip. <laughs> North Africa. North Africa, what happened? Not Egypt. Come on, someone, no microphone, just jump in. What happened on January 14? 
okay, Tunisia revolution. So Ben Ali, right? Ben Ali left the country because of the pressure of his people. But why is this historic? Why is this so, so meaningful and unprecedented? Anyone? What's that? Okay, I'll say it. You wanna say it? Uh, go ahead, <laughs> you say it. Okay, <laughs> so it was actually the first time that an Arab authoritarian regime was overthrown by its own people, okay? So we're used to either embargoes or uh, pressure or uh, foreign invasions attacking countries to get rid of uh, dictators or nothing or, or they're happy there for decades oppressing their people. But now we have a government that's overthrown by its own people, by internal pressure. Hmm? This is quite unprecedented in the region after decades of oppression from, uh, from these uh, leaders who are actually quite supported by the international, so-called international community. Hmm? So this is the context where working with, so game over Ben Ali, it's people did this. Hmm? Then we have game over Mubarak, it's also people, their own people, his own people doing this. Bye bye Mubarak. I really like this joke, please allow me. Okay, so, there. And we're witnessing this kind of, uh, what some people call domino effect, where Arab regimes are actually being threatened by their own people who have who hadn't been able to do this for years. So some, something is happening that's triggering uh, an ease that's been building up for years. Um, how, how is this happening and what part did social media and mobile devices play in these revolutions? I really love the Jed's uh, introduction. I, I thought it was amazing how he really, really uh, touched uh, a key point that, uh, that really affects activists. That sometimes you get um, this uh, narrative where media is everything and, and you hear about Facebook revolution, Twitter revolution, YouTube revolution, and, uh, and, and well, okay, it's people revolution, it's a human revolution, and sometimes you get the opposite. You get people who don't really give any value to, to, to the empowerment that people are gaining through technology. So we're somehow trying to, to give the, the proper dimension to technology in, when it comes to, to people sharing their voices with the world. Hmm? So what was the part? See, even, even Egyptians know, even, even the, the ones that you would probably least expect to be very familiar with Facebook, like the people on this picture, hmm, are, are saying, shukran shabab Masr. I mean, they're saying thank you, uh, youth of uh, Egypt, but they're also thanking Facebook hmm, with a handmade uh, note. So it, it was obvious that there was a, a part played by social media, although I have to, I have to say, that um, Facebook has not either officially or, uh, or, or non-officially helped demonstrators. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, if we can say something, we can say that it's made things difficult for activists with their um, identity policy, unlike Twitter or Google, who have actually um, officially supported demonstrations and freedom of speech online with the, with the technology that they're contributing to creating, okay? So Facebook was very helpful because people uh, knew how to use it and, and organize, but mm, I don't think we have to be thankful to Facebook as a company, okay? They're free to have their own uh, interests as a company, but I don't think as a, as a company we, we have anything to thank them for. Hmm? So about mobile, the Middle East and North Africa region has one of the fastest growing mobile technology penetration rates in the world. So a lot, a lot of people have mobiles. Not everyone has a computer, not everyone has internet access, but pretty much everyone, even in the, in the, in the very rural areas, most people have a mobile device. And 40% of user access, 40% of internet users access the internet through mobile devices in this region. And uh, in places like uh, Bahrain, Qatar, and other Gulf countries, it's uh, almost 50%. So it's, a, it's quite a lot compared to, to other things. Yeah, and so like we're saying, we have a human, we have human revolutions, we have human uh, um, uh, unease, instability, um, we have social injustice, we have corruption that trigger uh, the fact that people actually get tired of, uh, of these regimes that they've been handling, handling for years. So they go out, they take the streets, they occupy public spaces, they occupy public spaces on the internet as well, but 
It's actually through humans like this that something like this can happen. And I want to have uh, Ahmad explain to, uh, explain to us. Actually, this is his friend he yeah, told this me. This is Salma Said holding uh, a banner which says uh, first Tunis and now Egypt. Uh, the young man in the, on the banner holding uh, Hosni Mubarak from his uh, back neck <laughs> is Khalid Said. Um, he was uh, killed by the police on the 6th of, 6th of June of, 19, uh, of um, 210, last year actually, uh, six months before the Egyptian revolution took place. And um, the, the mobilization that uh, happened uh, on the internet and on the street regarding his case uh, was tremendous. Um, uh, many young people took to the streets for the first time. Uh, the, the kinds of young people who, are, who were before this moment were not usually engaged in politics uh, and social movements, um, took to the streets and participated in vigil stands and silent uh, protests uh, just to demand justice for Khalid Said and uh, for the trial of his murderers. Um, the, the page that was made for this case on Facebook became very popular and its, popula and, and its popularity increased tremendously uh, up to the moment that Here, it uh, was... You have it there. Yes, this page. Um, up to the moment that on the eve of the, of the 25th of January, uh, an event promoted by this page to, to go to the streets, to Milan al-Tahrir and other um, uh, viable places in Cairo to protest for social justice and we, hear, we can see here how the demands have morphed and um, evolved from justice for the murder of a young man to social justice and broader political reform. Uh, that event I was speaking about um, had 800,000 people who said they would be at attending or participating in the streets on the evening of the 24th of January. Just by looking at this number and assuming that 10% of these people will actually show up, you could feel that this time would be different. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, that page no longer exists on Facebook because it was taken down for fear of prosecution at some point later, but uh, it's, it's history, uh, a landmark nonetheless. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that was Khaled Said. Okay. So as we said, there's uh, well Khaled Said was a blogger, and uh, the, he shared his opinions online, and, and that's also why he was attacked. So mm. uh, no, no, not only no. Khaled Said was not a famous blogger, not an activist. He was okay. just a regular guy who went through what thousands of young people go mm. through in their. Uh, interactions with authorities in general and the police in Egypt in general. Yeah. Uh, it's a daily matter that happens in every city and town in Egypt and uh, lots of cases, similar cases happen just because this one had a face o on it of, a, of a, a guy from the middle class who obviously was not, um, who was not easily ve verifiable by the authorities. Okay that it gathered this team. Okay, nice, good. So uh, like um, Ahmed has told us, uh, citizens have been uh, in Egypt, have been uh, getting together to, to share news and updates related to these, uh, to these injustices that been, uh, they've been facing for years hmm, and decades. So citizen empowerment through technology, this is how we could uh, describe what's happening. So it's people finding their voices, finding ways to share their voices in, uh, in real life and, and show what's happening in contexts where information was very controlled and, uh, and uh, it was hard for information to, uh, to flow hmm, as it flows in, in other contexts. So this, this goes here. Maybe. This is yours, Ahmed, or no? no? Okay, let's go with yours. Oh, yeah. So how are how are um, how are people in uh, in countries like Tunisia, or uh, or Egypt, or Libya, or Syria, using uh, using uh, tools like Facebook or Twitter 
to, to empower themselves. They're using it to organize, okay, to organize, to set specific dates and times, like January 25 was a very important date. And uh, I want Ahmed to come again and, and show us uh, some uh, interesting stuff uh, that helps us uh, see the, the way people were organized in the field and how this has its reflection on the internet as well. You can come here if you want. Uh. I'd, I'd rather that you switch and I'll tell you about it, yeah? Sure. Um, yeah. This is just um, a rough uh, illustration of how on the 25th of January, Twitter was being used by activists on the streets of Cairo to navigate around the city. Actually, it was uh, very similar to what in the military called uh, command and control, except that I'm not a fan of the military, but it's ac and it's it's different in the sense it is uh, non uh, um, non centralized and distributed. But what was happening on that day is that people were tweeting their whereabouts, their movements, and the movements of the security forces, the blockades, uh, where where support was needed, where um, uh, holes in the security uh, blockades were made, and movement was easier and it was very interesting to see the Twitter stream uh, with the hashtag Jan25, how the, the protesters were moving around the city from the perimeter to the center where at the end of the day, as we can see later on, was the first signal that uh, a revolution was boiling and about to uh, explode. Uh, but before that happened, um, Egyptian activists have been building their networks for years. Uh, as uh, the speaker before me was saying, it's not very interesting for journalists to say that uh, there has been work and connections and uh, associations being established for seven or six years now on the, on the internet and, and, on, and of course on the ground in the real world. But this is uh, a graph made of the um, Egyptian Twitter users influence network. Uh, I'm somewhere here, uh, a little mm -hmm. medium-sized red circle on the upper, this side corner of the, <laughs> of the graph. Uh, it shows how people are connected together to t on Twitter. I'm not sure of the exact formula that uh, the person who prepared this used, what weight he gave to the different uh, parameters of the network, but it shows to a great extent, as far as I know, uh, the most influential people and connections between th those people on Twitter. Uh, this has been happening long before the 25th of January. So, again, um, it's not only the internet that can make a revolution or break it, it's the interactions and organization mm -hmm. and mobilization and elaboration of uh, demands and ideology that is forming in the overall uh, conversation that's taking place on the internet and of course in the street. Okay. On the 28th of, of uh, January, the internet was unplugged. There has been fluctuations before that. Twitter was blocked momentarily and we have to know here that um, unlike other country, Arab countries, Egypt had, no, had previously no censorship whatsoever on the internet. Twitter was blocked for a while uh, Facebook followed, and eventually on the early mm. hours of the 20th, the whole internet was plugged. We can go over this in a little bit if you want. Oh, okay. Sure, uh, we'll yeah. show the map and, and everything, and you, you explain to us. Okay, so like, like Ahmad was explaining, uh, twi Twitter, mainly Twitter, but also other, other platforms like Facebook were very effectively used to organize, for people to organize and decide when are we going to meet and where. Hmm? So I, I remember this tweet, I don't remember if it was Zenobia or who shared it, but I remember that she said that she was uh, amazed that uh, a revolution could be planned on a schedule. So can you imagine, on Thursday we're going to have a revolution uh, in Egypt, so please don't, I mean, don't make any plans, because we're doing a revolution. Yeah. That's, quite, that's quite unprecedented, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was a joke. I mean, tomorrow is the revolution. <laughs> I'll see you after tomorrow. I'll see you after was tomorrow. Really, yeah, an event, <laughs> uh, like an RSFB, event, VB event with uh, invitees, attendees, and guests. Attendees, and yeah. Really, yeah. That is pretty amazing. So apart from organizing, um, there's been an, a very effective work in uh, or, uh, registering in real life, in real life time, what was happening through mainly mobile devices uh, and uh, videos that users, that citizens were uploading 
to platforms like uh, YouTube or Vimeo and uh, using also streaming services like uh, Bamboozer or, or Ustream. So imagine the potential of uh, being in a place where journalists are not allowed in, such as the case in Syria, where journalists, uh, foreign journalists don't get any accreditations. And all of a sudden you have, look at this picture, this is Syria, okay? And this is people attending a funeral of, uh, of uh, friends and, and relatives killed the day before by, uh, by Syrian authorities. And, and you can see, we, we will try and see the video later, but we, you can see that there are almost more mobile phones than hands. So all of a sudden, every citizen uh, realizes that they are living something historic and they are both witnesses of what's happening, victims, but also citizen journalists that have a responsibility to record what's happening hmm, and to share it with the world. So there's this awareness which has a lot to do with citizens getting empowered and technology is uh, providing tools that, were, uh, that, that uh, we didn't have a few years ago and made it very difficult for information to leave these very closed uh, contexts such as uh, countries in the Middle East. So, Apart from, uh, from organizing and registering what's happening, of course, uh, there's the sharing and, and giving visibility and spreading the word all over the world of, of the things that are happening, like we saw through, through sites like Facebook or, or Twitter or, or blogging or, or other platforms. Also, we have the example of Nawat, which is a Tunisian uh, collective blog, which is actually pioneer in exposing uh, human rights abuses um, by uh, regimes on the, in the region and uh, bring visibility. And this has a lot to do with, uh, with um, this, has, this has a lot of credit, let's say, for what happened afterwards because revolutions don't happen overnight. I mean, they did have a schedule, like we said, but there's a lot of work, there's a lot of background behind this. And, uh, and uh, Tunisian uh, bloggers and activists have been working for years. And, and creating links with each other and with other citizens in the region uh, for this to be able to happen afterwards. So, like we said, we used to, be, we used to have, um, this is a Syrian banner, okay? So Syrian authorities have it on their site that they're going to give us the reality of events. Hmm? So this was the only reality of events we used to have was official communications in this uh, context. Hmm? Very, very centralized and uh, context where uh, the government decides what's news, what's relevant, what's information, and what is shared with the world. Mm? So we used to have only one reality of events, which was the one filtered by these governments. Mm? And this is an example. This is before yesterday. Uh, you know there are a lot of demonstrations taking place in Syria um, against the government and, and demanding pro-democracy uh, changes. So. Uh, these are pro-government demonstrators. The government has uh, organized or has uh, invited people, we can say, uh, to, to create or to, to, how do you say, to sew, coser, tejer, well, to, to sew, hmm? to sew the longest Syrian flag in history. Okay? So this is like a Guinness uh, record flag. Hmm? So the government invited, invited citizens to, to create the longest Syrian flag to show Syrian patriotism and to show the world that the people support the government of Syria. So this was what we used to have, this kind of narrative was what we used to see from countries like Spain. Was, uh, it was actually the only thing we, we heard from uh, places like Syria or from places like, yeah, mainly the Middle East. So now we have another side of the reality of events, which mainly happens through decentralized communications that uh, the internet tools and channels provide. Which is this? I don't know if, if the sound is working. This is Syria, a few days ago. So pay attention to the hands. Everyone's holding on a while. Okay. So 
So like we said, this is very useful for citizen journalists. <laughs> and now Ahmad, Shab, you read the Nidam, it's your turn. Okay, do you want to explain us? Do you want to see the video first and you explain, or do you want to yeah, give an introduction of yeah, who we're going to see? see? Let's see. Uh, sure. It's on the 25th of January. This was the first time people started chanting, the people want the regime down. It was the same chant uh, that was called in Tunis uh, two weeks before. And as you can see, mobile is shining everywhere. This was a very strong and, and sentimental moment. When you've been to so many protests, you get, you develop a sense of knowing how things will turn out to be. And this was unlike anything I had participated in or seen before. So uh, it was, I, I can't claim that I knew exactly how things will develop from, from that moment and for the following 18 days or until now, but obviously everyone who was there in the in Plaza Tahrir at the moment felt that it was different. We have this one coming. Do you want to explain this one so people know what we're going to show? Uh, which one is this? This is the other video that you... The other video, yes. It's yeah. uh, from the 11th of February, which uh, is after 18 days after the first one, when Mubarak, um, after giving us all uh, heartache, decided that he <laughs> is going to leave. And this was the moment when people found out about it. And again, you can see how people amazing. were capturing the moment. By that time, the internet was back. People were posting freely and sharing videos and photos again on the internet using their mobile devices and otherwise. This is quite amazing. Yeah, it's a little bit long, so maybe... Uh, yeah, just the beginning, maybe. Okay. Yeah. The, of the moment yeah. where yeah. Mubarak uh, fell, right? Yes, but it's not the one that we uh, we tried to find. Okay, well, there's lots of footage and lots of videos yeah. that everyone can see anytime. And I want to actually present you with a different kind of revolution that's actually happening today. Hmm? No. <laughs> Anybody has heard of uh, uh, Saudi Arabian women not being able to drive? You've heard of this before? Well, Saudi Arabia is the only country in the world where women cannot drive. So uh, there are a few women uh, for, for a few years now have been trying to bring attention to the fact that they're the only women in the world who are actually uh, banned and they can't drive. I mean, there's a law, there's some um, institutional discrimination that doesn't allow them to drive. So um, there's been a few, a few activists have been uh, working on bringing attention to this, but this one is called Manal Al-Sharif. A few weeks ago, a few, maybe a month ago, she recorded herself with a mobile phone. Uh, well, someone, her, her, someone in the car recorded her driving a car, so challenging, defying the, the prohibition. Uh, she uploaded it to YouTube, and it was widely shared online. Everybody started uh, talking about this issue, so it brought a lot of uh, awareness to the fact that they couldn't, uh, that women's rights in Saudi Arabia, they arrested her, so she was in jail for a few days, but there was so much pressure from in and out of the country that uh, they, they finally released her. What they managed, what the Saudi uh, authorities managed with this was that more and more women started driving and recording themselves and uploading this to YouTube. 
So it was harder and harder for Saudi authorities to actually track all those women who were actually so fed up of not being able to drive that they decided to, to, to take a, a step forward. So now today, June 17, is uh, the day where Saudi women are supposed to all go out, the ones who can drive because they have a license maybe uh, from another country. So they're supposed to go out, drive their cars, record themselves, upload it to YouTube, and this is a phenomenon on the internet today. It's uh, obviously one of the, one of the most commended uh, topics online today. So if you look for women to drive, hmm, that's, uh, that's what's happening today. So I wanted to ask you a personal favor, if this is okay. And uh, actually I, I came up with the same uh, uh, thing that Tristan did this morning. So I would like to take your picture and um, I would like to ask you to give a hands up to, to the women of Saudi Arabia, if this is okay for you. So can we do hands up to the women of Saudi Arabia? Okay, hands up, hands up, hands up. And another one. Okay, so I'm gonna do this right now. So feel free to search uh, the tag if you want, but I'm gonna share this right now. Just so they know that we're all thinking about them right now. Mm -hmm. So hands up. Two. Women to drive. From Nonik. There you go. <laughs> so I'm going to show you this real quick. It's okay because we have subtitles. يا على فكرة اليوم في جريدة الرياض ذكروا إنه في أخت أنقذت أخوها وأخذته على المستشفى بسيارتها فهي طبعا المرأة مش فقط ل يا مش للطوارئ المرأة مثل الرجل في أنها تعيش حياتها الاجتماعية وتكون بكرامة من غير ما ما تذل نفسها لأي أحد يعني مو كلنا عايشين ملكات ومدللات ومرفهات وعندنا سواقين مو كلنا يعني أنا مستحيل يعني حتى لو إني أقدر أجيب سواق مستحيل أخلي إنسان غريب يعيش في بيتي يعني هذه أمر منتهي منها لا وبعدين حتى لو يعني قبلتي بهذا الشيء مستحيل تتركينه مع ابنك أو مع بنتك في سيارة بتحطي معها لازم تروح مع المربية ولا الشغالة ويعني تكاليف ما لها داعي تكاليف ما لها داعي أبد so this is uh, Manal, Shari Manal Sharif and her, her, her ability to reach such a wider audience has a lot uh, to do with uh, the new technologies that she's uh, using very effectively just as uh, many citizens in the area are. Okay. So like we said, it's very useful. Mobile devices are, are becoming very useful for citizen journalists, but they're very, use very, very useful for traditional, in the, in the traditional sense of the word, journalists who have been uh, able to uh, give uh, a much uh, better coverage and, and footage of, uh, of very intense events using uh, these devices too, just as uh, Al Jazeera. I don't know if you're familiar with Al Jazeera. So I would really like uh, our Al Jazeera friends to be able to say a few words now. So can we try and connect with uh, Sherin Tadros and see if she's on Skype now? Hi, Serene. Uh, it's a little low. Can we maybe raise the volume? Um, hi. Hi, Serene. Hi. Can you hear us? 
Uh, I can hear you. Okay, I can hear you. That is great. Great. Okay. Awesome. <laughs> well, how are you doing, dear? I'm good. I'm good. Unfortunately, we have some um, we have some breaking news. So I'm I'm trying to do two um, two things at the same time, but hopefully we can make it work. You don't need me right for another half an hour. Is no, that no, right? no. I need you right now for a couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. Hey, go. You, okay, you ha we have, so I have about two minutes, but then okay. I'm going to need to disappear for okay. about 20 minutes. So let's use these two yeah. minutes. You tell us what is going on right now and how is Al Jazeera covering uh, this very, very historic footage and how is uh, technology and particularly mobile devices contributing to this, to your daily work? Yeah, well, I think that Egypt is one of those examples where um, the new media and social media is just so important in what we do because it is a huge country and it's very difficult for us to be everywhere and see everything. And one particular example that I can remember off the top of my head um, just happened just a few months ago, actually, after the revolution, when the state security people essentially started burning the files inside the police stations. They were trying to get rid of evidence because they knew that the interior minister was on trial and it was going to be you know, pretty bad news for them. So what happened was that some people, some activists, broke into these prisons and to these um, areas, these sort of administrative buildings where they, these files were being kept. And they started tweeting pictures and tweeting what was happening. So they were essentially the only witnesses to the burning of these files. Now, in the past, this kind of thing happened all the time, burning and shredding of files. But nobody was really able to document that. And anyone who would come to us and say, well, we saw it, we, we, you know, we heard about it, whatever, you could never really report that. But but because we had this sort of influx, influx of tweets, A, we could react faster to it, as in we started going live with the information. We sent a camera down to it straight away. But also, B, we actually had the evidence, the pictures, the video, whatever, that people had posted of all of this evidence. And that certainly was um, you know, a huge help to our job. Hmm. So you left Yemen a few days ago? Can you hear me now? Oh, I can hear you. I, I heard you saying about Yemen. Yeah. How are things going? I, I actually, I, I left Yemen a while ago. What happened was that we were unfortunately thrown out of the country, um, you know, at, at gunpoint, essentially, when we were told that if we were to stay, we, they, they would uh, harm the family of our producers. So we, we did uh, end up leaving after three weeks there. So that was about a month ago. I, I did try and get in again, um, just as Saleh was, um, was uh, said to be hurt and, and had gone to Saudi Arabia. However, just as we had got clearance to get in and we were all getting ready, and I'd already, as you know, flown to Doha so I can take that flight, yeah. uh, we heard that we weren't welcome anymore and Al Jazeera you know, would be detained at the airport if we tried to get in. So I think that was unfortunately an indication that he, uh, and certainly his son perhaps even more, were very much in control still of the capital, Sana'a, uh, and it seems as well, Taiz as well, so other major cities too. So we got this sort of influx of information at the beginning that he had gone, that Ali Abdullah Saleh had gone, he's not coming back, uh, which really may still be the case, but clearly the people that he left behind are still on his side and still very much pro Saleh because uh, we just have been totally unable to get in as other major news channels are finding the same. We're very impressed and very proud of your work, Serene. Can you please tell us what the, the way you see it, what is the future of journalism and uh, how does it relate to, to technology? and to the internet and the new tools and channels that are quickly replacing one another? Well, you know, one of the questions that I'm always asked uh, w when I'm speaking on panels and so, and so forth is whether I feel threatened by citizen journalists journalists and um, you know the fact that they often are getting the news out there faster than we are and I always think it's a strange question because I think it's such a complementary relationship there there are things that citizen journalists can do and and tweeters and, and people who put things on on YouTube um, you know especially right now when you're looking at Syria and Yemen and even Libya at some points where you can't get information out of certain places and these people are providing the, they are doing the journalism but at the end of the day I think you have to marry the two there has to be this influx of social media and these tools and this evidence gathering if you want from the ground but also it's up to us to verify that to make it understandable and put context to it and give it to the audience because we've had so many examples too of 
uh, video, especially in Syria, actually, that that's put on YouTube, and then you you come to look at it, and you realize actually it was Iraq in you know 2001 or whatever. So that happens a lot, and we go through a very rigorous process at Al Jazeera to try and verify all of these videos, and and you know so that we don't give you the wrong information. So I think that there is a huge role, and it's increasing more and more uh, for social media. If you look at any um, bulletin of the BBC, CNN, Al Jazeera, I guarantee you the first half hour, say of that bulletin, you'll find at least one report that re is relying on YouTube pictures, whether it's from Bahrain or Syria or Yemen, um, because it's getting increasingly hard for us to get into these places. Um, you know, we're literally being banned left, right, and center, not just Al Jazeera, but, but international media. So we are increasingly reliant on these um, various forms of social media to get picture and get information. But I think you have to marry that with real journalism, which obviously still has a role to play in terms of context and verification of, of what we're seeing. Shereen, we don't want to take uh, too much of your time, so we'll just uh, ask you to, to say hi or, or bye to Nonic Conference and Bilbao, and maybe we can have you real soon uh, join us uh, physically and uh, have your presence. Well, no. no, Nick, thank you so much for having me. I'm so sorry that I can't be there in person. I wish that I could, but thank you very much for allowing me to speak, and very good luck to the rest of the conference. Hard to go on after this. So that was Shirin Tedros, a very well-known uh, Al Jazeera journalist uh, covering the Middle East. So we've talked about the opportunities of uh, when we use uh, social media and, uh, and mobile devices to cover real-life events and to cover historical moments that the, the area is going through. But there are also, of course, risks involved at using these, uh, these devices and at using these uh, uh, technologies. One of the risks, and the most obvious one, is visibility itself is a risk. So when you want to expose what your government is doing and, and the abuses that you're suffering, of course, visibility is very good, and that's the good part. But then you're also helping governments have access to information that it would be so much harder to, to get without these technologies. So, so you're actually serving them the information they need to identify you. So when you share stuff on Facebook using your real name, because Facebook forces you to share your real identity, unlike Twitter, you're actually not only sharing your contact, your information, you're, you're, you're actually sharing your whole network. And you're allowing governments to track your whole network, so, so networks of activists can be easily traced by, by those governments interested in, in surveilling users' activity online. So this is an example of uh, how easy it's, it is for governments now to identify um, activists. This is Iran in 2008. These are the protests against the, the elections. And these are actual uh, screen graphs, captures of YouTube videos that activists uploaded to YouTube so the government took captures of all those videos, uh, uploaded them on Flickr, published them on Flickr, and uh, did crowdsourcing to identify these people. So they asked their supporters to, to, uh, to write the names and, and circle the faces that other users could identify, telling their name and, and, their, and their address and, and identifying them. And it, obviously you cannot say no when your picture is in there. You cannot say, no, I wasn't there. Well, the picture is there for good and for bad. So that was, uh, yeah, crowdsourcing to identify activists that was uh, made much easier by, by these technologies. So, of course, uh, uh, an uh, obvious risk to using these technologies is the physical violence that uh, these uh, repressive regimes impose on, on activists. And uh, for this part, I was really counting on Haidar, on our Iraqi friend, to, to give us, uh, to share his experience on how he got arrested beaten by the police, he got his mobile phone stolen. Uh, only uh, yesterday they, they stormed into his house, took his laptop, took his mobile phones to, to see what he was uh, doing and, and the information that he was uh, capturing. So I really wanted, uh, wanted you to meet him and he was gonna talk to us about his project that he co-founded with other activists called Iraqi Streets. 
where uh, this is like a collective blog where they share uh, footage, uh, mainly through YouTube videos and other contents, of uh, what's happening in Iraq on a daily basis that uh, citizen journalists are sharing. So let's see if we are as lucky as we were with Shireen and we can connect with Haidar now. Meanwhile, you can ask questions about... <laughs> yes, you can go ahead and ask any question. Hello? See? Hi, hi there. Marhaba. Hi, how are you? Hi. We're so lucky to have you here. How are you, dear? We can see how you. How are you? We can see you very well. How are you? <laughs> That's good. Mm. I'm fine. So I was telling these people about why you couldn't make it. They were, they were as sad as, uh, as we are, that you cannot be here with us. Yes, sorry, because I, I wish that I was to be with you in this conference, but you know what's happened with me, that some forces enter to our city and cut the trees and take some youth activists and demonstration here in Iraq and take them so I can go out to my, out my city to to travel to to Spain to this conference so well we can still see you see that technology is so good yes, sure. that we can uh, be friends online as well so I sure. wanted to ask you to give us uh, a little more examples on the work you are doing and, and you and your friends and your your colleagues on uh, Iraqi streets maybe tell us a little bit about the project and how you guys are using mobile technology, how is it helping your cause? Yes. First, uh, I'm Haidar Hamzouz. Uh, uh, my age, 22. I'm a student in uh, Fine Arts College uh, in Graphic Design Department. Uh, I work uh, in some companies as a consultant and trainer uh, on social media networking. So, uh, I uh, I'm uh, my website uh, or blogs. Uh, it's a blog site, so um, uh, it's, it's independently run by three young men. When I, one of them, me, uh, we began this idea to build a free space of expression and to give people a chance to express their views and to establish an active and influential dialogue between the various spectra of the people, a dialogue based on uh, mutual respect between all the participating parties, regardless of the size of different in views of uh, our beliefs. So peace building, freedom of thoughts and expression starts from here, from Iraqi streets. So it's a free space for any people. Um, um, we using this, we using social media networking in this, uh, in this website. We are, we are writing about the daily life in Iraq, what's happened in Iraq. So this idea, it's a, it's a begin to small corner of an office of the city in Baghdad. We with vision of creating a space of a free exhibition. Uh, it's, it's like a platform for all opinions, regardless. Um, um, so this is Iraqi streets. Uh, we have also um, another blog. It's called Iraqi Streets for Change. We are working to cover the, the peaceful demonstrations that happen here in Iraq. Uh, we are using um, many tools to, to cover uh, these demonstrations by using our mobile phone uh, to, make, to tweet from Tahrir Square. We have also Tahrir Square in Baghdad and all the whole, on all of Iraq. Uh, we are using, uh, we are using 
Facebook, Twitter, and any tools that I can record what's happened here in Iraq and record anything. We are also have uh, something like a creative map. It's a creative map to, to see uh, how many demonstrations happened in Iraq from the, the revolution from Feb 25 February till now. So this, this map, when some demonstrations happened in Iraq, some people send um, a message that we have demonstration in some place in Iraq, north or south of Iraq, in, uh, uh, on, my, on my mobile. So automatically we, we will show that on a map to see how many demonstrations happened in middle or north or south of Iraq. Okay. Um, yes. So um, maybe I, I will invite you, Haidar, to, to stay okay. with us online, to stay uh, follow us uh, through the streaming. And I invite you to actually tweet some of the, of the work that you guys are doing on Iraqi streets, maybe one of the, of the videos that you're uh, more uh, proud of or that you think uh, we in Spain, uh, we, should, we should see to understand what's happening and what you guys are going through. So if you want to tag whatever content uh, with the no nick tag, uh, it's gonna show on our screen and we're all gonna be able to see it and it's gonna reach a, a wider audience. And I really want to thank you for joining us today, even if it's uh, via Skype. We're really lucky to have you here. Yes, thanks, Greg. Thank you. So now say hi to Nonik. Uh, so thank you, dear. Talk to you later. Thanks. So, see, it's hard again to go on <laughs> with these uh, interactions with these amazing people. So like we said, there's, uh, they're facing physical violence and they're facing uh, not being able to leave the country and they're, they're facing all kinds of boundaries. But like you saw, he cannot be here, but he can be here. And this is something that's not so, easy, so, so easily controllable. So now there's also media war from, from governments against technology. Like here, there are some pictures of, uh, of uh, some weapons that the Syrian government took from, uh, from activists so you can see knives, you can see sticks, and you can see mobile phones with SIM cards. So the footage is mobile phones using non-Syrian SIM cards and digital cameras containing fabricated videos of acts of violence found on members of armed criminal group. Okay, so mobile phones are part of uh, the criminal uh, um, materials. And there's also, of course, blocking. Um, just blocking services like SMS that are very popular uh, in, in this area to exchange information. Uh, there was a, black, a BlackBerry ban, so people could not uh, access BlackBerry anymore, and it was suspended in uh, Dubai, in uh, Euro United Arab Emirates, and in Saudi Arabia, so users could not use BlackBerry anymore because uh, information, communications through BlackBerry are encrypted, so people cannot, uh, so governments cannot surveil uh, user activity online through these devices. And there's also cases of complete shutdown. And I wanted Ahmad to explain to us what happened in January, between January 27 and January 28. Yes, as I was saying. Oops, sorry. Um, starting from the evening of the 27th, a gradual shutdown of communications methods were, was taking place obviously by orders of state security uh, directed to uh, mobile operators and uh, ISPs. Um, and by, the, by the morning of the 28th, there was no internet, uh, no mobile phones in Cairo. Um, so even landlines were cut uh, from several areas. SMS has been cut well, before. Maybe here. Yes. Easier to see. Um, so eventually, after, I mean, starting from the 28th, which, w uh, which, uh, which is when the sit-in in Tahrir took place for the next 10 days, um, 15 days, um, people were completely isolated, save for little islands of people who had been using ISPs who were little low-profile or uh, were so 
um, small that they were, were omitted or not uh, noticed by uh, state security. And those very limited islands were the only ways where websites were published and uh, some photographs, uh, some photographs uh, 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 smuggled to the world. Um, so from that moment on, people were completely autonomous, isolated, uh, back to traditional methods of organization and communication, uh, doing the regular thing uh, of how revolutions uh, adapt and um, get and broadcast information among the activists. So what do you think the, the technology that was being used from that moment on was like? <laughs> Does, the, does anyone have a guess, any idea about what people were using to fend off the thwarts of the government? Well, let's Should we show uh, them? Yeah. It's this actually. Catapult. This was being built in <laughs> Tahrir Square sometime around uh, the evening of the 2nd of February, where a Middle Ages type of battle was taking place just at the end of that street, around the corner with barricades and stones and clubs and yeah, it was a great night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, after, after Egypt did this, bro came up with a great idea to shut down the internet, Libya came up with the same idea and then Syria came up with the same idea, as if you can actually uh, control and stop demonstrations by shutting down the internet. So this was started, uh, this was being called by uh, users online as to pull a Mubarak. So when a government decided to shut down the internet, he was pulling a Mubarak. So what's next? What's next is more surveillance attempts. So the government will work, governments in repressive regimes will work harder to control users' access to information and to control uh, users' activity online. And maybe you can explain us what this is. This is Gamma Group. Maybe you can explain to us the story with Gamma Group and, and Egypt uh, Yes, uh, after the storming of the state security uh, buildings, headquarters in Cairo and other cities, actually it started uh, in Alexandria and uh, Damanhur and then Cairo, uh, activists uh, found documents relating to requests for proposals by the state security police to providers of um, eavesdropping and uh, spying software that could eventually break into uh, accounts of social media and allow the government to monitor uh, communications. Up, now we know that up to that moment, the government was really back on the issue of tracking and uh, eavesdropping. Um, the documents were published, and there are um, cases now uh, in courts of law uh, against both the local uh, providers, importers, and the companies in Germany and England who were providing uh, the proposals to the state security police. So actually, yeah, uh, group Gamma Group and, uh, and other Western companies are the ones uh, mainly providing these uh, repressive governments with uh, technology to surveil users. And it's mainly 80% of the technology uh, governments like, such as Mubarak's uh, used uh, to control users online was actually Western, was actually mainly from the United States. And uh, well, so what's next? More surveillance and also more work on user protection. So we have here Twitter. Well, I don't know, I think we can see it here. But here's uh, the Twitter uh, symbol. Uh, Twitter created with Google a service uh, so that, uh, can you tell us about Speak to Tweet? Yes, uh, as you were saying, uh, our friends in Google uh, collaborated with Twitter to create the service uh, by which you dialed uh, a number and uh, recorded your voice message and it would then be posted on the internet somewhere for others to see it. And uh, the funny thing is that uh, at first it was being used by activists to report about uh, what was happening in different parts of Egypt and later on it was uh, discovered and stormed by pro-government uh, people who tried to spam it. But eventually the messages, I mean all the messages came out and this is what's important in social media because you don't really count uh, on filtering the noise at the source, but rather doing the analysis and um, the, 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 see the saving of the messages later on. So it was a typical 
case of using social media where noise and signal are intertwined. So that was a service uh, that Google and Twitter helped create and there are other projects being created by, uh, by activists like uh, Witness, which is a video platform that enables uh, users to record events and, and share them. And uh, they're actually working on, on the first part we saw, where we saw visibility was risky. So they're working on this technology so that when you record something, the face of the person you're recording becomes blurry. So you can actually see what's happening. You can get an idea of, of the event, but you don't see the, the exact features of the, of the person. So let's real quick, this is one minute. I'm demonstrating a prototype uh, at the hack day of the um, facial recognition and um, obfuscation app uh, that we built. So basically I hold the camera up, I point at the face, and there should be a, a black box appearing to protect the identity of the person being filmed. So I'll point this here, and there we go. So it's a little, we're still debugging it, but it, it's accurately finding the face. I can move, it'll track them. And you can actually t tap on the face and it'll do something, maybe. Anyway, so there we go. So this is on Android using the Google Android built-in. Uh, oh, so there, it just, it just extracted the face. So it's using the built-in Android facial recognition. There we go. Cool. So just like we saw, uh, there will be more and more surveillance on the part of governments. There will be more projects by users trying to protect themselves from the surveillance and more and more the cat and mouse game between governments and activists will take place actually on the field of mobile technology. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe there are any questions or... Please, guys, you're so talkative on Twitter and then you're so shy in here. Why did you pay all that money? What, what are you doing with the video archive? Like, what, what, what is the, uh, what are you actually putting together and what will you do with it? Yeah. Uh, during the sit-in in Tahrir, we uh, set up a camp. We called it Media Camp, where we, hang, we uh, hung a banner and we invited people to give us uh, footage, video footage and photographs that they took um, anywhere in Egypt. And we, and during few days, we accumulated a tremendous amount of them, t uh, gigabytes, uh, 150 gigabytes of, ma of, of footage and photographs, which we later on, uh, which we would f even at that time give to anyone who wanted them, anyone who came to give us, we would ask them if they wanted a copy of what we have. We gave them to journalists, television journalists and reporters. And later on, when we had the internet ba back, we uh, created torrents and cr put them in, into batches and distributed them for, for wh whoever wanted to use them. And um, later on, again, uh, there was um, a committee formed in the National Archives, Egyptian National Archives, to, to preserve the relics of the revolution, not only digital, not only footage and video, but everything, uh, manifestos, printed uh, banners, uh, even jokes and slogans that were uh, chanted and called in Tahrir. And uh, there, are, there are several initiatives actually to archive um, the, the, uh, the huge amount of media about this revolution. But you can, wh whenever you're watching Al Jazeera or BBC or other documentaries about the revolution, you be sure, be assured that you are seeing material, at least part of it, of what we were collecting in Tahrir. Um, the, um, the Egyptian archive is uh, setting up the system, building the repository, and it's open to the public with the aim of preserving it for the next uh, generation of historians. Uh, but this specific collection, because I have it, I will eventually submit it to the archives, uh, since I'm also part of the, of the, archive, of the archives committee. Uh, but it's not only restricted to this collection that we accumulated, it's about w whatever people would submit. So I had a question. Um, the the Western companies doing the you know the surveillance. I had learned about the fact that McAfee, for one, I think we even talked about this a little last night. But 
McAfee, a security company that some of you guys probably use, that they are doing all kinds of stuff. But, you know, what's a strategy, what would you guys want to do to, I don't know, raise awareness? It, it seems difficult just because it's so many layers deep in terms of there's a technical aspect and it's secretive and, you know, just getting activism going in general is sometimes tough. Like, you know, what's what's a strategy to just raise awareness of that at all? Um, I have been training activists, lawyers, and journalists on privacy and anonymity on the digital realm for for years now, five or six years. Uh, but the great thing about Egyptian activists in particular is that they ignored all of this. They they worked in public. They didn't use any technology to combat whatever the government was trying to do, and they decided that um, so be it. Anything anything that would happen can happen, but um, I have also to say that it's not the same everywhere. For example, in Syria, the crackdown on activists is much more violent uh, than it was in Egypt. Uh, so I guess it's a case-by-case case thing to judge. Is, do you think there's, I guess what I'm asking those, do you think there's anything that can be done to pressure those companies on their home turf? Yeah, certainly. Uh, this provider I was uh, talking about, the German company, which name I don't recall at this very moment. Uh, there are uh, lawyers in Egypt who are uh, suing it for providing such service that would invade the privacy of citizens, even according to German laws. Uh, so yes, uh, there are legal steps being taken. But um, as usual, the best thing to do, well, maybe in that, not in this case, the best thing to do in general when, when, uh, with a commercial provider uh, like uh, McAfee or when uh, or when Apple neglect to mention that they are collecting uh, spatial, spatial information about their customers, is to talk about it. But in this case, the companies are not uh, mainstream. They do not sell uh, in a high profile. They just market to niche uh, markets and uh, security agencies. So it's a little bit different uh, dealing with them. There was another question there. Maybe you have a, maybe you have to speak about it, but uh, uh, I will ask uh, again. Uh, what's the what's your strategy about the, the fake information? For example, uh, for example, some months ago here has been a, a small revolution or similar, and uh, on Twitter there were a lot of photos that were fake photos. Uh, Try to be like. Apparently, they were uh, uh, photos from from activists, but then there were fake. So it has the uh, an effect against activists because uh, they lose uh, reliability. Or mm. so, what uh, strategy did you use to to avoid this kind of spam uh, that wants to? to uh, attack the reali reliability of the activist. Um, regarding, what, uh, regarding what's happening, for example, in the National Archives project to collect uh, footage and photographs, we're not, we're not filtering anything. We're just accumulating whatever there is to be preserved. Uh, we're not judging, we're not analyzing, we're not uh, writing the story or the narrative of the revolution. Uh, this is the, the job of historians and social uh, scholars to do later on. Um, uh, and looking the other way, the, the web is full of media, which authenticity is something to debate always. So uh, we're not preoccupied with the, with the validity of the media we're collecting. And another question. Uh, a lot of activists, maybe uh, they are uh, new technology users that have not enough experience about uh, security risks. Um, do you have any strategy about uh, uh, forming this kind of people about security? Is, I'm not uh, speaking about uh, cryptography or similar, about uh, a good use of technology. Uh, don't install unknown applications on your Android mobile. Uh, some weeks ago, there was a rooted conference as a a hacking conference about security, and they were speaking about a malware of, of, of the, uh, on Android platform that they were starting searching on the servers 
that the malware was connecting to, and there were a, a Chinese company that was uh, of the uh, of the Chinese government, and th there are a lot of malware like that that maybe pe uh, people they don't think uh, feel secure because they don't have enough information. Within the social network, information seeps in a very different way that, uh, than what, what, um, what, really, than what is uh, seen in conferences. Uh, only a fraction of activists are concerned with the technicalities of how the internet works or whether HTTP alone is not as secure as HTTPS. This is all something that must be done gradually and transferring knowledge from per one person to the other and via the, the um, traditional challenge of uh, people learning and sharing knowledge. There is no, as far as I have uh, witnessed during my work, uh, there is no effective way to propagate huge amounts or, or, huge, uh, or a large amount of specific information and training of security to activists. Uh, whenever I trained activists, I always told them it's good to know these things but uh, not, it's also better not to get paranoid about them. If you can do without them, then this is what activism is about, this is what social and political reform is about. You do things in the public and you weigh uh, the possibility that you can get prosecuted or harmed, but this is how societies develop and change. It's not by doing things underground only. They're telling me it's we have to stop now, but please guys, uh, let's continue the networking and maybe we'll, you'll feel more comfortable to ask, especially him, we don't have the chance to talk to activists uh, uh, who live the Egypt revolution every day. So let's all meet at the party and the networking afterwards. So I would like to ask for a very big applause for Leila for this brilliant session. Thank you, Leila. Thank you, Ahmed. Okay.